Hey, what's going on? I'm Will Button. This is DevOps for Developers. And I have no idea how you found this video because absolutely no one is searching YouTube for capacity planning videos. But no matter where you are in your career, this video is going to help you get better. By learning these capacity planning skills, you'll better understand how to architect systems, how to rationalize the architecture of the systems you're currently supporting, and how to make incremental changes to a system to improve performance, efficiency, or costs. All right, let's jump right into it by understanding what capacity planning is. Capacity planning is the ability to handle the workload for your application. That means having enough servers and disk space and bandwidth and computational power to provide your service to your users but without having so much that you're paying for resources that aren't being used. So it's a bit of an art form because your capacity needs change over time. This can be a dramatic swing in the number of users using your system over a 24 hour day or a rapid increase in users due to a successful marketing campaign. The systems and processes you put in place to handle that represent your capacity planning. So here's the big takeaway. And if you get absolutely nothing else from this video, just remember this, you're gonna be wrong. So good capacity planning is less about being right and more about being able to react when you're wrong. To start, you wanna adopt architectures and deployment practices that make it easy to change your deployed application. Otherwise, you've completely lost any of the benefits of using flexible cloud providers, right? and you'll find yourself paying for resources to provide the flexibility that you can't take advantage of. So what does a scalable application look like? Well, most applications scale in one of two ways. Horizontal scaling, meaning to add more servers, or vertical scaling, meaning to use bigger servers. You'll end up using both of these approaches in different parts of your application. The most common approach is called an N-tier architecture. With a relatively large number of application servers utilizing horizontal scaling, talking to a relatively small number of database or other data store servers that use vertical scaling. Now this approach is pretty tried and true and it'll get you a long way. So one thing that I will caution you against is the BGD model, where BGD means, but Google does, which is fine. Here's the deal you don't have the scaling problems that Google does. And if you ever do, you're gonna have thousands of engineers to throw at that problem. But if you try to build for Google scale right out of the gates, you're gonna create a system that is so complex, it will prevent your ability to grow as a company, meaning you'll reach the unemployment line long before you reach Google scale. Decoupling is another concept that is important to capacity planning, and it will honestly just make your life easier, which is a good thing, right? In our N-tier approach, we have multiple scaling strategies in place. That means we may be scaling one part of our application, but not the other parts. The problem is that all parts of our application have to have knowledge of the other parts, even when that information is constantly changing, right? This is where decoupling comes in. To put it in practical terms, Something like a load balancer needs to know which application servers are available to serve requests. And our application servers need to know what database servers are available to talk to. Now you can hard code this into your application, but that's not flexible. Every time a new server comes online or an old server goes offline, we would have to update that hard coded value. Instead, we want to decouple the discovery of those resources from our application itself. We can do this using DNS. If we need a database server, we just use a DNS name like database.example.com and we rely on our database scaling mechanism to ensure that only valid database servers are listed in the DNS entry. You'll see this used a lot in Kubernetes and some other tools available include service discovery tools like console, your own API discovery service, or even streaming platforms like Apache Kafka. Next tip, point and click is bad. Here's why. So both the application architecture and the decoupling may be something that's already decided for you depending on your role. One thing that you do have direct control over though is how those services are built and your decisions will make or break your ability to be flexible. Let me be very clear here. If you're logging into your cloud provider's website 
and pointing and clicking to create new servers and resources, then SSHing into them to configure them, you're failing. You want to automate your infrastructure so that you can create and destroy resources with no manual configuration required. Tools like Terraform, Ansible, CloudFormation, and Pulumi are purpose-built just for that. And here's one other pitfall I commonly see. It's also a personal pet peeve of mine, deploying your infrastructure from your desktop or your laptop. So even if you're using something like Terraform to build your resources, but you're running Terraform Apply from your laptop, that's not automated because your laptop had to be part of the equation. You want your CI CD server to handle your infrastructure deployments, just like the software engineering team does for code deployments. Next tip, estimating capacity. So now that we understand how to architect our application and how to build it, the next question becomes, how much do we build? And this is a really tough question, to be honest, and it'll require a bit of trial and error for brand new applications. So the first step is to define what your limiting factor is. And it's important to define this from the perspective of your customer. Your applications aren't gonna care if requests take 500 milliseconds to complete, but your customers will. So take the time to define what success will look like in their eyes. From there, you'll need to do some load testing. And before you get carried away, let me tell you that no amount of load testing will ever simulate what real world random humans do in your application. But really that's okay. We don't need to be perfect. We just need to be close so we can see what breaks first. So we'll define our threshold, some metric like request must complete within 200 milliseconds. And then we'll start load testing and just crank up the knobs until we hit that value. Now we're gonna start looking at our application to determine what's the limiting factor. What you'll see is many of your infrastructure resources are doing just fine, but one component will be struggling to keep up. This could be your application servers, your database servers, or your network. The important thing is to identify it and focus your scaling efforts there. And it's gonna be very different for every application. That's the whole reason we do load testing. And now that we know how to scale our application, we can focus on when to scale. And there are two main reasons. Number one is cutting costs, and number two is increasing capacity. Focusing on costs, though, can quickly lead down a rabbit hole. It's kind of weird. It's one of those few areas in our world where what we do has tangible results. In most of our careers, we build infrastructure that no one cares about or even knows about as long as it's working. But when we start to manage costs, we can provide real-world evidence of our actions that sort of justifies our role in the company. And that can be a bad thing because it can send you down this rabbit hole. So here's a thumb rule for you. If you're spending less than $1,000 a month on infrastructure, don't even bother with cost saving efforts. You'll spend more time in wasted man hours than you'll actually recapture in savings. When you get to like $20,000 a month and up, then there are some opportunities to be had. When the teams I work with reach that point, we do a couple of different things. One, we set an infrastructure budget and we manage against that budget. This budget's also communicated to the finance team as well so that they're kind of in the loop and can set expectations of what our expenses are gonna be each month. Then on the 15th of the month, we do a budget check-in. So basically we just check our cloud provider bill at that point and verify that it's roughly half of the budgeted amount. We also do that again on the first of the month to make sure we didn't exceed our monthly budget. And if we did, then we'll dig in, see what service costs increased that took us over the threshold, and we'll work backward to see if the additional costs were due to increased utilization or unexpected capacity. And then we can evaluate if this was a one-time thing or if it's expected to continue and either adjust the infrastructure or the budget as necessary. The common denominator to all of this is knowing that we'll always be wrong. And I'm totally okay with that. There are too many moving pieces to accurately forecast. So instead of trying to predict a future, we focus on building tools and processes that allow us to flexibly react to the future. The end result means we're much more dynamic and able to focus on helping the business build successful products for our customers rather than limiting that growth through hard-coded, invalid procedures and assumptions. If you would like to learn more about how capacity planning ties into all the other aspects of DevOps, 
Be sure to download my free DevOps roadmap guide. There's a link in the description down below. And it's kind of a choose your own adventure guide that lets you identify some of the aspects of DevOps that you may already be familiar with. You can explore those and then see how they interact with the rest of the DevOps ecosystem. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.